Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. What's going on guys? It's Daniel. We are back here again today. We are looking at the creation of the soul and this is a video by a merciful servant. This is something I don't know that much about so I'm looking forward to this. Hopefully we get to learn something new and um, let's check it out. Now, how about the uh, children of Adam and their ruh? Where does our ruh come from? We learn this from the Quran and from the Sunnah. There's only one reference indirectly in the Quran and the Sunnah has a lot of references. As for the Quran, Surah Al-A'raf verse 172 is the only detail that we have on this issue of where we were created, our ruh was created. And the hadith mentions there's three or four. I'm guessing the word ruh means soul. Hadith that mentioned this narrative. What is Surah Al-A'raf verse 172? Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِن بَنِي آدَمَ مِن ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ Remember, remember, whenever Allah says وَإِذْ, it means remember, recall, recall. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِن بَنِي آدَمَ مِن ظُهُورِهِمْ Remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from the children of Adam from their backs, that He took their progeny. And وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ He caused them to be witnesses against themselves. They took the dock, the witness sand, and they witnessed, they testified against themselves. Now the verse needs to be understood in light of hadith. The hadith gives us the fuller picture. What happens? The hadith tells us, and I'm going to summarize three or four hadith. There's these hadith are in Sahih Muslim, in Musadraq of Al-Hakim, and in uh, Abu Dawud, there's a reference as well. You put all of these hadith together, what I'm saying is the conglomeration of a number of hadith. We learn from the hadith as follows. That when Adam came down to this earth and Allah Azza wa Jal accepted his repentance, we learn from our tafsir literature that this acceptance took place in Arafat. I'm liking this video because right away there's this focus on hadith, focus on Quran, focus on tafsir. Great. This is not a hadith, it's <clears throat> tafsir literature. And this makes sense because Arafat is where tawbah is accepted from the hujjaj. So Allah accepted the tawbah of Adam at Arafat. This is, remember, it's not hadith. So when I'm very, uh, you will learn this about me. I'm very, I try to be accurate. I don't just mention things like this. Whenever I say something, I always try to back, where did I get this from? And if I never, if I don't say this, always ask me, where'd you get it from? We have to be very clear here. Our religion is based on the evidences and the sources. We don't just, we don't just spout things out. And we differentiate between the Quran and between hadith and between statements of the Sahaba and between statements of earlier scholars, we differentiate between them, not all are on the same level. Where do we get this idea? That this is amazing. I really am liking this video so far because of what he just said. When we talk about stuff, it's very important that we have hadith to back it up, we have Quran to back it up, have tafsir to back it up, something. Because when we just start saying this stuff, maybe you're correct, but if we don't have anything to back it up, then uh, other Muslims can't verify what you're saying. So it, it helps so much to, to sort of base uh, the things that we talk about on hadith or Quran or tafsir or all three. That Adam's tawbah was accepted at Arafat, we find it in early tafsir literature. Some of the tabi'un said this. It is not in the Quran, it is not in the sunnah. <clears throat> so we can narrate it, but it's not something that is yaqeen. Early scholars of the second generation, they held this view that Adam's tawbah was accepted in Arafat and we say it makes sense. Now, one thing we know for sure from the hadith and now we come to the hadith. Once Adam's tawbah is accepted, the hadith says, this is from the hadith, this is from the Prophet and this hadith is in Mustadrak al-Hakim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rubbed the backbone of Adam and from the backbone of Adam, he extracted every single soul that would be in existence until Qiyamah. Now this is very important now because this is our origin and birth. This is where we come into existence as our souls. Where was Adam's soul created? Up there. Who created it? Allah directly created it from there. From what? We have no idea. No mm -hmm. idea. It is something beyond. Where was our soul created? In this earth it was created. From what? From the backbone and we can say from the soul of Adam. Okay? And this is what the Quran is mentioning. From the 
And that's really beautiful to think that all human souls come from the same place because it sort of unifies us in that way. That's really beautiful. Zuhur, from the backbone, from the sulb, in the, the hadith uses the word min aslabihim, right? The sulb. And min bain the sulbi wa taraib, right? Min ma in dafi yakhru min sulbi wa taraib. What is sulb? Sulb is the backbone. So the hadith mentions Allah extracted from the backbone and from the soul, whatever you want to call that, every single soul that would ever be born until Qiyamah. And this happened at Arafat. So when I'm at Arafat and I'm doing Hajj with my group, I always say, we were born in Arafat. And there's truth to this statement. We were born in Arafat. Our spiritual birth, our physical birth, where our mothers gave birth to us. But our ruh was born in Arafat. This is in the hadith. Okay? So, Allah Azza wa Jal created our ruh from Adam directly. And this ruh, it exists. Just dropped my phone. You guys probably heard that. Whoops. Existed without a body. There is no body, obviously. This is the beginning of our ruh. And the ruh then, the Quran tells us that, Ashhadahum ala anfusihim. He caused these arwah to witness against themselves. You see, in our constitution, we have something called the fifth. What is the fifth? Hmm? Fifth. You, you have the right to not testify against you. Oh, you have the, the fifth amendment, right? Right to be, <laughs> be quiet. I thought, I thought he was saying some Arabic word. Fifth. <laughs> He's talking about the Fifth Amendment. Yeah, you have the right to remain silent. But on Judgment Day, and right now, there is no fifth. On Judgment Day, Allah will نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِدُ There is no fifth. Your body will testify. The good and the bad. We ask Allah's afiyah. And when we were created, there is no fifth. And Allah speaks directly to the souls. And what was the question? It is in the, in the Quran. Alastu bi Rabbikum. And this is called Yawmi Alast. The day of Am I Not? Yawmi Alast. It is also called the day of the Mithaq. Because Wa'id Akhad Rabbuka min bani Adam idhurim dhuriyatahum. This is the Mithaq. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Akhad Allahu Azza wa Jal al Mithaq. Min, uh, Bani Adam, uh, the Prophet took the Mithaq from the children of Adam at Arafat. So the word Mithaq is used. What is Mithaq? Mithaq is a covenant, a treaty. So what was the treaty? What was the covenant? What was the conditions of the treaty? Very simple. Don't you know I am your Rabb? Mm -hmm. Don't you know I am your Rabb? And again, this is so powerful because Allah didn't say, I am your Rabb. Rab means, uh, in English, you could translate it to like Lord. So he's saying, uh, don't you know I'm your Lord? He said, don't you know I am your Rab? Am I not your Rab? What is the difference between saying, I am your Rab versus saying, am I not your Rab? The first is a teaching mechanism. The first you say to somebody who doesn't know anything. The first you say to somebody on a blank slate, you tell him, this is your God, this is your Prophet, this is your Quran. You are teaching. The second is a rhetorical question, which you do not say to teach. You say to confirm something that is already known. Right? To confirm. A rhetorical question is not used to teach. A rhetorical question is used to confirm something already known. Allah did not need to teach us that He is our Lord. Do you understand this? A very deep point. Allah did not need to teach us who created you, who is your Lord. Allah didn't need to do that. Allah is simply affirming, Am I not your Lord? And what did we all respond? The Quran says, Bala. Yes, O oh Allah, you are our Lord. Yes, we affirm you are our Lord. Now, at this point in time, at this point in time, we are souls. Question. Have these souls been sent a prophet? Yes or no? No. Have these souls been sent wahi, Quran, Torah, Zabur? No. Have these souls had a chance to even you have an aql and wander in this earth and look at the ayat of Allah? 
No. So how are the souls expected to know when there is no wahi, there is no revelation, there is no prophet, there is no ayat at tadabbur How are they expected to know? Response, the fitrah that Allah created the soul with. The fitrah is something that is ingrained in us. Fitrat Allah lati fatara nasa alayha. So the souls were scattered in front of Allah. How do we know this? The hadith. Fanatharahum bayna yaday. The Prophet said, He scattered all of these souls in front of him. Allah scattered all of these. I'm just going to quickly look up what does the word fitrah mean? Because he was mentioning this word, and I could kind of understand what he meant in context, but fitra is an Arabic word, a oh, state of purity and innocence in which Muslims believe all humans and jinn were born. Uh, so the ability to choose or reject gui God's guidance. Okay, so this is sort of like our nature, our state of purity and innocence. Yeah, this seems to be human nature that we are all born with. Okay, good to know. Souls. Adam is there, all of us are behind Adam. This is happening in Arafat. How many souls? Every single one. We were there. Our forefathers were there. Our children were there. Everyone that will ever live and breathe, even one breath, was there. <clears throat> all of us were there. And he then took the covenant. This is the Mithaq. Okay. This is the creation of our soul. This soul, it remains in a state that we don't have any idea about. We have no idea where it is. Nothing is mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah until the next reference. And that next reference, Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the Hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, basically he uh, coagulates the creation uh, of the fetus inside of the womb of the mother until finally uh, a certain number of days pass, then the angel comes with the ruh. And the angel blows the ruh into the fetus. Ma. Who blew the ruh into Adam? Allah Azza wa Jal. Who will blow the ruh into us? Me and you and our children and our forefathers? The angel. Big difference. Allah gave Adam. Allah gave, يعني, honored Adam in some ways. And the angel comes, the angel blows the ruh into the fetus. And that... That is a beautiful thought, is it not? Imagine an angel blowing your soul into your little fetus body. That is pretty beautiful. That is when the fetus takes on a living status. Now, our scholars of fiqh, our scholars of fiqh uh, go into a lot of detail when this occurs because there are repercussions that have to do with when and under what circumstances is uh, the Islamic verdict of abortion, which is much more complicated than, uh, than right now. That's a fiqhi discussion. But it all centers over when the ruh is blown in. Because that's when this entity becomes a living human being. And when that happens... I mean, that would make sense, right? Because otherwise, if, if there's a human body without a soul, it's just sort of a, a sack of meat, really. Uh, there's no soul, then it's not really a human, it's just flesh. So it wouldn't really make sense that you could murder someone that doesn't have a soul. So it makes sense. Then to take that life is murder. And before that happens, there's controversy. So I'm not going down there. Maybe one day we'll have a Q&A about that's a separate issue altogether. But the mm -hmm. point being that this is the uh, second stage. So there are five stages, by the way, of the Ruh. Very quickly go over them. Number one, the first stage from the creation until before the fetus. We have no information about nothing from the Quran and Sunnah. Where is it? Who is protecting it? How is it living? Zero information, nothing. The second stage, when the ruh is blown into the fetus and it remains in the body. And this is essentially what we are right now. And we can call this the wakeful state so that was pretty interesting he was saying where are human souls before they are blown into the fetus and we don't know anything we don't there's nothing in the quran nothing in the sunnah that would uh, give us any reason to believe that we know where these where the human souls are pretty interesting the state of the child or the young man or the old man when they are awake a lot and this is the body and the soul are together and combined in one and the both of them are conscious. This is the wakeful state.
The third is the sleeping state. And the sleeping state, the ruh leaves the body, wow. but not permanently. The ruh leaves the body, but not permanently. And there is some connection that the ruh has with the body. What that connection is, we really don't know. But there is some connection. Ibn al-Qayyim mentions in his Kitab al-Ruh. Wow, that's very interesting that they said that the soul leaves the body when, when we sleep. This actually confirms an experience I had. Uh, this was four years ago, five years ago. I was sleeping one night and I had a dream where I died in the dream. I felt my body, le or, sorry, I felt my soul leave my dream body. And um, suddenly I was uh, traveling through a sort of light um, tube, um, portal, right? And kind of like um, Star Wars or something when you see the lights flying by. Shh. And I came actually through this light portal into my physical body and slowly merged with it. And then I could, you know, slowly I could feel my breath, I could feel my body. And then I was fully merged with the body and I woke up. And um, what was interesting is when I woke up, I realized that the moon, it was a full moon and it was shining through my window right onto my body. And so that was, uh, <clears throat> that was a very interesting experience and it sort of confirms uh, here what we have in the Quran or in the, in the Sunnah. Maybe it was, I'm not sure actually where he mentioned that from, but it says that the body or the soul actually leaves the body temporarily while we sleep. Uh, so that's uh, pretty amazing that it confirms a dream experience that I had years ago. Others mentioned this as well, that there seems to be some type of thread connection, like a minuscule invisible thread between the body and the ruh. I've heard of this that before That the too. ruh and the body are still somehow, now this isn't an actual thread, you cannot cut it with, it's a metaphysical thread, it's a thread that is from the ruh world, not from the body world. And the ruh and the body are connected and that's why when something happens to the body, the ruh rushes back and you just wake up, whoa, what happened? <laughs> like it comes back immediately. You wake up with the jolt, right? So the ruh is coming back immediately. So. The issue of the ruh separating from the body during sleep is something that is explicit in the Quran and in the Sunnah. This is something very okay. clear and it is a part of our theology to believe. What is sleep? Sleep is the temporary separation of the ruh from the body. And of course, there is the famous verse in the Quran that mentions this. Allah says in the Quran, Allahu yatawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha wallati lam tamud fi manamiha Allah takes two souls. Allah takes two souls, two categories. Number one, when the souls die. Allahu yatawaf al anfus, right? When they die. Number two, wallati lam tamut fi manamiha. And those that are not dead but they're asleep. So Allah is explicitly saying, I take the souls of those who are sleeping. So sleeping, Allah mm -hmm. takes the soul away. But it is a temporary taking away. The barzakh doesn't begin there. The barzakh begins when the connection breaks between the body and the uh, soul. And that's why our Prophet also said, for example, he said, Annawmu akhu al maut. It's an authentic hadith. Three words Annawmu akhu al maut. Sleeping is the brother of death. Sleeping and death are twins. Sleeping and death are very similar. And that is why mm -hmm. it's very common for people to pass away in sleep because. Allah says, فَيُمْسِكُ الَّذِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَ الْمَوْتِ Those whom Allah has decreed will die in their sleep. Allah says, He keeps the soul. وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى And the others, He sends them back until their time will come. This is all in the Qur'an. And that's why it's very common. One of the most common ways of dying is a peaceful death when you go to sleep and you just pass away, you don't wake up. This is mentioned in the Qur'an. So this person, his soul went to sleep, then the soul is taken away and then death occurs. So this is the third state. Right? That is very humbling to realize you think about when you sleep it's just up to Allah whether or not you you come back that is very humbling you know you might go to sleep and then you don't come back it's just Allah's choice right so memorize this this is something that we should all know number one pre-birth number two and this begins in the wombs of our mother and that is the relationship we have right now because by the way 
modern science has shown, even the fetus is awake and asleep. Even in the womb of your mother, there are states when you're awake and there are states when you're asleep. Subhanallah, this is hadha khalqullah. That even that pre-born child, right? The child inside the womb of the mother is already awake and asleep. And then when the child comes out and we are now that stage, it's the same in terms of the relationship between the body and the soul. So the, the, the second we said is the wakeful state. The third is the sleep state. And because sleeping is the brother of death, there shall be no sleep in Jannah or in Jahannam. Mm -hmm. There is no need to sleep because there is no death. Wow. You will perpetually be awake without caffeine. Can you believe that? <laughs> Why is there no sleep in Jannah? Because sleep is what? The taking of the body out of the soul and that's not going to happen in Jannah. So there is no sleep in Jannah. You're never going to get tired in Jannah. That's the third state. The fourth state is what we're going to talk about in our series and that is the Barzakh. And the Barzakh is this time barzakh. frame when the Ruh and the Jasad break the connection, when the Ruh and the Jasad break the connection and that Ruh then goes into this zone called the Barzakh and then the fifth state comes and the fifth state is when the final trumpet is blown. Not the first trumpet, the final one. Some ulama say three trumpets, some ulama say four trumpets, some ulama say two trumpets. We'll talk about the issue of trumpets when we get there after the barzakh. The very first lesson after the barzakh will be talking about the number of trumpets and the scholars' difference of opinion over that. But the point is, the barzakh lasts until the last trumpet, not until the first trumpet. When the first trumpet is blown, the first trumpet is for this dunya, not for the people of the Barzakh. The people of the Barzakh have nothing to do with that first trumpet. The second or the third or the fourth, depending on how many trumpets you affirm. Inshallah, we're going to jump the gun here. I will say the correct opinion, Inshallah, from the Quran Sunnah, seems to be two trumpets. Many ulama said three, many ulama even, some ulama even said four. But to the position I will advocate, and Allah knows best, will be two trumpets. And... The barzakh lasts until the second of the two trumpets. Then the fifth stage begins, and that is the final stage. And what stage is that? The permanent reuniting of the ruh with the jasad in the next world. So the jasad is not the jasad of this dunya, flesh and bones. It's a different type of jasad. It's a different creation of Allah, not this creation, not this world that we live in. It is a different world. And when that reuniting occurs, that is going to be the permanent reuniting and the most perfect reuniting that overshadows all previous four stages. And that is why there is no moat, there is no sleeping, there is no tiredness, there is no negative issues once that happens and the ruh and the jasad are fully reconnected. Our series of lectures will deal with category number four and that is <coughs> the issue of the barza. Is that it? That is. Wow, so did learn some new things there in that video. Um, alhamdulillah. Uh, I did already know, you know, I, I, I had learned before about the Adam's spine and that's where all of our souls came from. And I think I just kind of forgot about it, but that was a good refresher for me. And then um, what else did we learn? The, the angel breathing into the fetus. I think I'd heard that before and that was that's very beautiful to <clears throat> to be reminded of. And um, yeah, the, the, I think the highlight of this video for me was learning that when you sleep, actually your soul literally leaves your body. And this again confirms uh, an experience that I've had within my own life in a dream. So that is amazing, subhanAllah. Um, thank you to a merciful servant for watching this video. May Allah bless them generously. And of course, God bless all of you for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed that. May Allah bless all of you. And uh, inshallah, we will see you in the next one. Masalama.